All right, everybody, let's get to it. Welcome back to Classics 160D2, Classical Mythology, and today's lecture on Perseus and another type of hero, quest heroes. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means and how we can differentiate these types of heroes from the ones like Achilles and Theseus and the ones that we've talked about so far already. So let's take a look at what we got on the docket today. Uh, we're gonna start with announcements and a brief recap. We will go into a little bit of a definition kind of thing, talking about what we mean by quest heroes and why it's kind of a useful way uh, to sort of categorize some of the heroes from Greek mythology. And then we'll take an, a look at uh, two particular heroes. So first we'll start with Perseus, uh, who of course is after Medusa, and then we'll finish with Bellerophon and the Chimera, uh, which also has one of the greatest like artifacts from the ancient world. There's a bronze Etruscan Chimera, we'll take a look at that later on, um, but a very, very cool uh, piece of, of antiquity representing mythology. Um, okay, so what do we have with announcements? You guys know the basic ones already. Go ahead and put it into speaker view so you can see me, you can see the notes, you can see my San Pellegrino, which kind of you can see. Anyway, today's class is brought to you by San Pellegrino when you're looking for a fancier sparkling water. Anyway, um, other announcements. Uh, you've got about 10 days, a little more than 10 days uh, until your revised draft of your research proposal is due. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the TAs will talk a little bit about that on Friday. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, um, well, I'll talk a little bit about it today too, I guess. Uh, let's see, midterm exam. All right, very nice work. We've got these things graded now. I looked at the grades. The average is an 87. You guys did really well on this thing. Overall, really, really pleased with it, all right? Uh, if you're like looking at it and you're like, well, I didn't get an 87. Do not fear, it's all right, right? This is a relatively small portion of your grade. One of the ways, one of the things I've done in constructing this class is really tried to make it uh, so that there are lots of kind of different small pieces of grades that build together to give you your final grade. Um, and the nice thing there is that if you botch any single one of them, it's not a huge deal. Uh, you've still got the revised draft, you still got the final exam, you still got a couple reading responses, uh, you've still got the attendance things. Um, you you know, you could have gotten a 50% on this exam, and I think you can still get an A in the class. Um, and so don't worry too much about it. Do take it into account for the final, right? I'm going to be shooting for a similar type of difficulty in terms of the questions that are asked, and a similar um, kind of scope when it comes to the the essay questions that are asked, right? Trying to ask those questions that um, definitely kind of measure the degree to which you've been paying attention and taking notes and that sort of thing, um, but also uh, are put forth in a way that gives you some of your own agency in terms of how you, you answer it, right? So that there could be multiple different answers uh, that are correct depending on how you support those answers. Okay, revised research proposal. The, uh, the general idea to this thing is that it's an expansion on the first draft. So one of the questions that we always get, right, is like, oh, well, like, can I use what I've already done as part of the final thing? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely, right? You're going to have to kind of like alter it a little bit. If you just like copy and paste the whole thing in there, it's gonna feel really like herky-jerky, right? And the transitions won't be smooth. So you're gonna to need to smooth it out and edit it a little, but if you're happy with what you've got and your TA was like, this is the greatest research proposal I've ever seen, like absolutely build on that, right? You don't have to throw away something that's really good. Um, the kind of big leap here, right? What I wanna see in terms of where this progresses is uh, work that's actually been done on the sources. The idea with the first draft of the proposal was that you've started to identify sources that could be useful, okay? Um, so that you kind of know a little bit about what they are, you know who wrote it, you know what the source is called, you know a little bit about how it might be useful for you. In the revised draft, I want you to have actually gone and like read through some of it, right? So you should, you should be able to kind of discuss the source and um, what it tells us uh, about your, your topic, okay? Um, if you have questions like in terms of 
uh, sources or, you know, conceptualizing your idea or whatever, right? Feel free to talk to your TA. Uh, again, start that process early. Uh, because the class is so large, each TA has, you know, 100 students or so. Um, and so if you do this, you know, the, the Thursday before the things do, it's just going to be really difficult to get any sort of substantive feedback. So start that process early. Um, and now for what you guys have all been waiting for, right? The extra credit. Um, okay, so here's the deal. One of the things that, that you guys are, are working on, um, that everybody in the university is working on when you be, kind of become college students, is trying to convey your ideas in a slightly more formal, more academic manner. All right. Now, the problem with that is because, you know, I've got 500 students and the TAs each have 100 students. It's really difficult. It's easy for us to kind of like identify and say, hey, your prose needs to be formalized a little bit. But it's hard to go to the level of like explaining how that exactly works. Right. For each individual student. And so what I want to do is reward you guys if you go out of your way to talk to the resources that are on campus about how to do that, all right? And there are two main ones. There's the Think Tank Writing Center and there's the Writing Skills Improvement Program, all right? And the way this is gonna work, I haven't posted it yet. Right after class, I'm gonna put this up on, uh, on D2L. Um, you can go to their websites and you can make online appointments with them, right? I think it's like half an hour or something like that. And in that, just say like, hey, I'm working on a research proposal for my mythology class. I've got a draft of it. I would love to work through whatever, right? Pick the part that you want to work on. Generating ideas, supporting it with evidence, formalizing my prose, whatever you find most useful for you. Say that that's what you wanna work on and you'll sit down with them in a Zoom for half an hour and go through uh, a draft of your proposal. Uh, what I would like you guys to do is send them the document that I'm gonna post on D2L, right? It's just like a one page Microsoft Word thing. You type in your name, your email address, you type in the tutor's name once you figure out who that is, you type in the tutor's email address. Um, I guess I should put my email address on there. Uh, and it's just the thing that you send that to the tutor and then they're just gonna forward that to me with your name on it. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Ooh. They're gonna forward that to the TAs <laughs> with um, with your name on it. And TAs, you guys just like keep a spreadsheet of your students and have like a little checkbox. And so if they, they do that, put a little X in there or a check in there. And then at the very, very end, uh, we'll give you five extra points on this thing. Um, it's a decent part of your grade. So, you know, if you get an 85, you, you bump up from a B to an A. Um, you know, if you get a 75, you're gonna be bumping up from a C to a B. It can make a pretty decent, um, difference in the, the overall grade uh, for the research proposal. So uh, start taking advantage of that early. Uh, it works best if you have a draft of something to go in there with uh, so that you can actually work off of something, but that's a way to get a little bit of extra credit for the course. Okay, so those are announcements. Let's talk a little bit about heroes versus heroines. This is what we were talking about uh, last week in the, the recorded lectures. Um, and one of the big kind of takeaways here is that heroes and heroines share a lot of the same kinds of traits, all right? Uh, and so those kind of being, right, they die, uh, they're worshiped after their death, they're worshiped at their grave site. Death is usually something remarkable, violent or mysterious, um, premature, something along those lines. And the reason they're worshiped is because it's thought to have some sort of, um, you know, they're, they're thought to have some sort of power after their death. So the traits themselves are pretty similar. One of the major differences uh, is that for male heroes, their heroicism and extraordinary deeds tend to be something that they perform, right? Extraordinary strength, a particular deed, something along those lines. For women, right, for heroines in antiquity, it's very frequently uh, something that they, they almost more endure. Right. So with Helen, it's the, the capture of Helen and her being dragged off to Troy uh, with Clytemnestra. Well, she kind of does uh, some heroic things, depending on your perspective and whether you're Agamemnon or not, I guess. Um, but she also endures, right, like having to be alone for 10 years, that sort of thing. Uh, Antigone is doing something heroic, but also enduring uh, a punishment as well. So 
Many have the same traits. One of the big differences is that men tend to be the ones performing heroic acts. Women tend to like endure kind of terrible things in, in large part, but with like a heroic kind of courage and bravery and that sort of thing. All right, and in particular, we talked about uh, three different um, heroines, right? So we talked about Helen of Troy, uh, Helen being one of the offspring, right, of Zeus and his early, um, well, his many uh, trysts. And this time it was with Leda, right? And as a result, because it's this Leda in the swan story, according to many of the myths, Helen arises uh, out of an egg. And so some of the depictions, right, she's, she's seen being born out of an egg. Um, now, there are a couple different things that, that go on with Helen. Uh, for a while, she's like part of this thing with Theseus, where, uh, where they decide, Theseus and Pirithus decide to go take some women, Helen being one of them. But the one that we all really know, right, is her being uh, either abducted or seduced by Paris and then taken from Sparta to Troy. Uh, we also took a look at Clytemnestra. And Clytemnestra, and we've heard this uh, through a couple of the, the Friday sessions um, I think with, with Katie in large part talking through uh, the Oresteia um, and uh, the, the story of Agamemnon. But she's basically left at home and she starts to, uh, to talk about, um, uh, or sorry, she's left at home and she starts to plot uh, the death of um, Agamemnon with, uh, with Aegisthus. And then finally, we have Antigone, right? Whose brother ends up dying, the king at the time, forbids any funerary rites um, for her brother. And she is able to kind of defy that order and say that the law of the gods, right, uh, in her duty to her family is above even the kind of laws of man, right? The laws of the city state, like those fundamental duties um, are, are more important. And she's going to see those through regardless um, uh, of, of what the king says. So three of the heroines that we talked about last week, uh, you should be able to find those. I got one question in the chat there. Um, if you missed the lectures last week, there are still recorded lectures on uh, on week 10. So you should be able to go on there, check it out. I think everything should be on there. Um, I'll check it while you guys are doing uh, your attendance for, for later today. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, quest heroes, right? So the heroes that we've talked about so far, uh, like let's take Achilles for example, right? They tend to be uh, heroic in large part because of their characteristics that are brought on by some kind of association with the gods, right? Being born part god or being born blessed by the gods or something along those lines. And so when you have somebody like Achilles, what we're thinking about, right, is uh, his incredible strength and speed and skill in battle, uh, his bravery and courage, those sorts of things. We tend to think um, about those kind of heroes uh, based on their kind of traits, right? Uh, when we look at quest heroes, so we have a uh, we have Sean Bean here as like uh, an old adaptation of Odysseus in the Odyssey. Um, and we tend to associate other heroes with kind of the quests that they're a part of, right? So when you, when you think of somebody like, let's say like Perseus would be a good example, right? The first thing that comes to mind isn't necessarily the traits that he embodies, right? Strength or speed, even though he, he is those things. The first thing that comes to mind is like the quest that he's associated with, um, the, the quest in that case being Medusa in the Odyssey's case, right? And Odysseus's case, uh, that being the, the journey, right? From Troy back to Ithaca to see Penelope. Uh, and in many ways, when we're looking at these two, it's the, I, I don't know, from my opinion, at least it's like the, the quest heroes that end up being, um, a little easier to kind of identify with, Right it almost maps more onto the traditional narratives that we end up seeing in movies and things like that, where there's kind of one main thing that ends up, ends up happening. Whereas with people like Achilles, right, it's more of uh, these internal traits that are embodied in different ways. So in many ways, when you read these stories, the ones of the quest heroes, uh, they're easier to get into um, because they tell the story in a way that's a little bit more familiar to us. 
So when we're talking about quest heroes, um, basically, you know, if you have to put a, a real brief definition not on it, it's somebody who's kind of more known for uh, their particular adventure than they are for um, their particular skill or their remarkable death or their, um, you know, ability in war or something like that. Uh, it's the adventure itself that almost defines the, uh, the hero. All right, so let's go ahead and, and nuance that a little bit and put some different traits on there. And so along with this, right, um, we're gonna see that the, uh, the with these kind of quest heroes, right, their, their main characteristics uh, involve their, their journey, right? That's kind of the main thing that they're associated with. They're very frequently in motion, right? They're kind of constantly going from one thing to the next um, uh, as they work their way through that journey. There's usually either an object or a person, a treasure, something at the end of that journey that they're trying to obtain. And then along the way, they meet different types of people, right? Some people trying to impede that journey, right? Enemies, monsters, that sort of thing. And then some people trying to help them on their journey, right? The traditional kind of helpers or friends. And as you're looking at this, right? Like one of the things that may be going through your head is like, Oh, but like you could actually define Theseus in this way, right? Like, yeah, he has his like kind of trip up to uh, to Athens, but like then his journey would be to Crete for the Minotaur and he is moving around a lot and there is the Minotaur at the end and the Minotaur is kind of a monster and he's helped by Ariadne. And you're kind of totally right, right? Like when we break these, these um, categories down, it's not like they're super distinct, okay? It's not like there's no overlap between like an Achilles style hero and a Perseus style hero. It's just a little bit of, think of it almost like a Venn diagram sort of thing where it's kind of a convenient way to, to start grouping heroes in, in Greek mythology. So the difference is very much one of degree rather than one um, of just absolute kind of difference. Okay, so. Uh, a number of different scholars have started to, to kind of define um, what what it is to be one of these, these quest heroes. Um, and so this is one of the early guys here, right? And he goes through his list um, that there's an object or a person that must be found or possessed or something along those lines, that the it's a long journey undertaken by the hero. Um, there is a hero involved, right? There is one particular person to kind of focus on. There are tests and trials. Um, there's somebody who guards whatever that object is, whether it's a person or a material object. And then that there's there's helpers along the way, right? In addition to the, the monsters or enemies preventing the hero from getting whatever they're after, there's also people, um, humans, animals, um, that offer the hero something to help them along their journey. And if this starts to sound familiar, uh, it very much is in the same vein as like Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. And so some of you may have heard of this before um, in your, your high school English classes, something along those lines. But a number of different people have attempted to synthesize stories that focus on heroes and pick apart the kind of core aspects that all those stories share. And so Joseph Campbell was one of the early people to do this in the late 1940s. And he, he kind of coined this term, the, the hero's journey something that's broadly applicable to lots of different stories like this. And it begins uh, with this kind of call to adventure uh, where the hero is called on this journey. And very frequently, not all the time, but very frequently, at first there is a almost kind of refusal of the call, right? At first the hero is hesitant to go out on this journey for whatever reason. But eventually there's some sort of kind of supernatural push right along the way uh, and they cross this threshold from the world of the known right the world that they're normally a part of into the the world of the unknown right the actual part um, of the journey itself and then as they start that journey they begin to interact with different people this is where the kind of helpers or mentors come in to kind of aid them along their journey give them information or knowledge that sort of thing um, and that's also where uh, different kind of um, enemies or monsters come in to impede them upon their journey 
uh, trying to prevent them from gaining that object or person that they're after. And then what we're looking at down at the bottom here, right, that there is some sort of um, kind of climax to the story where it is the ultimate monster, right, where they, they have to un un overcome that final thing in order to obtain uh, what it is they're after, right, where they actually go down into the abyss, right, into the underworld, something along those lines. Uh, and then after obtaining it, they begin to be transformed and are reborn in a sort of way. Um, and kind of start this process of atonement where that eventually leads them back uh, from that journey, from the world of the unknown, right? The world of the journey itself to the world of the known, where they kind of uh, take their rightful place um, in their whatever it is, right? As king, as something like that, um, as a result of the, the journey that they've, they've been on. So this is just one way to think about it. Um, and what we're looking at here is a way that a lot of different people have kind of conceptualized this hero's journey through the ages. And there's no need to like write down every like, um, you don't have to write down like all the characteristics for each person. Um, I'm not gonna ask on the exam, like what Christopher Vogler's like initiation characteristics were in 2007. But the point here, right? is that this has been something that a lot of people have focused on, that the idea of this kind of hero's journey or the quest hero is popular enough um, that people have spent a fair amount of time studying this thing, trying to pick apart what those kind of core characteristics are. Okay, so let's take a look at a few uh, kind of of these quest heroes just very briefly, right? So these are very, very short overviews. We've got Jason, right? His quest to obtain the Golden Fleece. We've got Perseus, um, his main quest to obtain the head of Medusa. Uh, and then later on, as we'll see today, uh, he's also involved in rescuing Andromeda, the Princess Andromeda. Um, there's Bellerophon and his quest to fight the Chimera. Uh, and then, of course, Odysseus in his quest to return home after the, uh, the Trojan War. And what we can see is when we look at these, um, we can see examples of, of kind of these different traits that we just looked at, right? So when we look at the helpers um, and the villains along the way, right? So with somebody like Jason, uh, he's got his crew of Argonauts, right? Um, at the same time, he runs in, and we'll see this on Wednesday, he runs into a series of different uh, kind of villains along the way, um, like, uh, for example, the, the giant Talos. Uh, and then Odysseus, um, he's helped and kind of hindered in a way uh, by Circe. Uh, he's hindered by Polyphemus. Um, we see like Circe as... Um, this is a, a kind of common trope here that, that many of the, the women that these heroes interact with along the way end up being both helpful, but also like potential hinders along the way. Um, we'll see that with, uh, with Medea as well, right? She helps Jason, but later on it's actually, it turns into a problematic relationship. Okay, uh, in terms of villains, right? Um, when we're thinking of villains uh, along the hero's journey, uh, they can be anything, right? They can be people, they can be like all kinds of like beasts, like a particular animal. They can be these kind of hybrid creatures like we're looking at here. Um, and so this is the chimera, we'll talk about it later on, uh, but it's got the head of the lion, right? The head and body of a lion. It's got a goat's head coming out of its back. Its tail is a poisonous snake. Um, and this is this really cool artifact. It's known as the Chimera of Arezzo. And Arezzo is a uh, old medieval Italian town, a little bit um, kind of near Florence. And, uh, and you can still go see the, uh, the Chimera of Arezzo today. Um, they're frequently located in places um, that are on the very outskirts uh, of the Greek world. So kind of natural places that are difficult to access, um, that are separated from civilization, things like mountaintops, oceans, caves, that sort of thing. Um, and then they act, right, with this kind of wild, chaotic nature. And so this gets back to an idea that we talked a little bit about when we were talking about 
Uh, if you remember the, the Metopes on the Parthenon, right? It's always the Greeks fighting different groups of people. In a way, uh, the stories associated with quest heroes are doing something similar, where the heroes are associated with society um, and civilization, whereas the villains are kind of representative of un-Greekness, right? Uncivilized behavior, living outside of towns in faraway places, acting crazy and chaotic, unlike the kind of calm civilization of Greek society. All right, so we can see again some of these helpers, right? We've got Ariadne helping Theseus. We've got Medea helping Jason. We've got Penelope uh, setting this thing up for Odysseus so he can be the one uh, to solve things when um, he returns. And so these, um, these helpers along the way also embody uh, kind of Greek ideals in the sense that the things that they do um, end up promoting kind of this idea of society or civilization. Okay, so let's take a particular look at one of these heroes. And we will start with Perseus and Medusa. So you guys have already heard, right, way back at the beginning of the class, the story of the birth of Perseus. And so he's the son of Zeus and Danae. And if you remember, Danae's father uh, gets a prophecy that his grandson's going to kill him. And his solution to this is to lock his daughter, as you can see, yeah, his daughter over here, Danae, in this kind of like tower, right? The princess in the tower. Uh, but Zeus comes to Danae in this form of golden rain. You can see the ancient depiction here falling upon her belly, uh, eventually impregnating her. And then nine months later, we get little Perseus born. So poor Acrisius, right? Well, not really poor Acrisius, but Acrisius has not been able to overcome the prophecy yet. So plan one has been a failure. And instead, he's moving to plan two. So plan two is just take the mom and the kid and put them in a like trunk like this and then like set them out to sea. And this is always like, I don't know, you hear this stuff. And my first thought is always like, just just kill them, right? Like, you know, just kill them both. But they can't do this. The idea behind not being able to do that, uh, of course, is that if you kill a family member or something along those lines, it's really bad karma with the gods. OK, so you're going to incur the wrath of the gods if you just straight up kill them. So they come up with clever, <laughs> clever or I don't know, in this case, not so clever ways to try to get rid of um, of people who uh, are prophesized to take their place. So Acrisius puts them in a trunk, nails it shut, sets it out to sea. Um, and eventually it floats to the island of Seraphos, where it's hauled out of the water by Dictus, um, the brother of the king Polydectes. All right. So it's hauled out of the water by the brother of the king. Um, and the king like opens the trunk and sees Danae. And his first thought is just like, hmm. What a treat. She's looking pretty good. <laughs> the month in the trunk has done her well. I don't know. He wants to get busy with Danae. Um, and so he sends like Perseus away, right? Um, he locks Danae in a room. He sends Perseus to the temple of Athena. And, uh, and he's going to do what he wants to do. Um, okay, so the way that he, uh, he ends up kind of uh, getting rid of Perseus for good, right, after he sent her, uh, him to the temple, is to send him on one of these quests, and is to go kill the Gorgon Medusa. And so the idea is that Perseus will be out of the way, he can then get busy with Perseus's mom. And the idea behind the whole quest is not so much that he really wants Medusa dead. I guess maybe he wants the head, but really, the idea is just to occupy Perseus, and hopefully Perseus will just get himself killed along the journey. Okay, so who is Medusa, right? Medusa is a Gorgon, um, and the Gorgons are kind of uh, the offspring of a, of a sea deity uh, and a sea creature. And she's one of three sisters, and it's kind of interesting in the sense that Medusa actually ends up being uh, mortal, whereas the sisters, Theno and Uriali, are both uh, considered kind of deities. Uh, but Medusa's main characteristic, right, 
um, is the ability to turn people to stone through her gaze, right? So when she stares at you um, and when you stare at her, you're going to turn, well, yeah, basically when she stares at you, you will turn to stone, all right? So there, you gotta find some way to avoid that uh, if you're ever gonna get close enough to Medusa to do anything um, about it. Now, when we look at Medusa uh, in ancient depictions, right? So we've got these kind of like, I don't know, fan fiction depictions like this. Um, we can see a much later depiction uh, here. So this is um, not an ancient statue, it's a, a more modern statue. Um, but when we look at her in antiquity, uh, we can see her on this, this cup over here. And one of the big differences is you very, very, very rarely see anybody facing forward in Greek art like this, right? Like in, in Greek vase painting. They're always depicted like, like this person, Perseus, right? Uh, you get them pictured in profile, right? But when we look at uh, when we look at Medusa, she's very, very frequently like staring right at you. And this gets to the idea that like, you know, her power is like staring at people and turning them to stone. And so she's kind of seen as this like wild woman here, right? This terrifying face, bulging eyes, the tongue sticking out, snakes for hair, um, and then often facing the viewers as opposed to being depicted in profile. She's also given these wings very frequently here. Now, there are a couple problems, right? So the, the problem with like Medusa being able to um, turn people to stone is that Perseus needs some help to be able to actually, you know, get the head of Medusa. Uh, and so in order to do that, he's got to find three different nymphs who are going to give him the kind of weapons and tools necessary to be able to take care of Medusa. The problem with that is that he doesn't know where these nymphs are. And so in order to find them, he's got to first go uh, to these old hags here known as the gray eye. And uh, the gray eye or the gray ones, they have a single eye amongst the three of them. And they have a single tooth amongst the three of them uh, as well. So they probably, I don't know, had, had soup a lot because you can't do a lot of chewing with just one tooth. But Perseus, I, and I kind of feel bad. Perseus steals their eye and their tooth. And he's like, I'm not giving your eye or your tooth back um, until you tell me where these nymphs are. And I don't know, it's kind of a jerk move, but eventually the gray eye have no choice. They reveal the location of the nymphs. Um, and then Perseus is able to go get the weapons that he needs to defeat Medusa. So what he ends up getting, first he ends up with winged sandals, or in this case, in this depiction, we see both the, uh, the winged sandals as well as a winged hat here. Um, that hat as well uh, is able to make him invisible um, uh, at certain points in time. And then he needs, of course, a bag as well to be able to hold the head after he gets it so he doesn't accidentally go around like turning everything and everybody to stone. So that's one version of the story. Other versions of the story have him receiving gifts from like Hermes and Athena and Hephaestus, right? So some of those stories, um, it's like he gets like a, a shield from uh, Athena that's able to reflect the gaze of Medusa. So again, the exact way that this happens uh, differs from, from version to version, but what is consistent is that he needs help along the way, either from these nymphs or from the gods in order for him to complete his quest. So eventually he is successful uh, in getting these things. He's successful in finding the Gorgons. Um, he's able to decapitate Medusa um, in some stories, again, using that shield to reflect the gaze and then cutting off the head of Medusa and putting it in the bag for safekeeping. Uh, here you're looking at like, this is one of the coolest, I don't know, in my opinion, one of like the coolest uh, Renaissance statues um, depicting Perseus with the head of Medusa. It's found in, in Florence. This is a replica here, um, but it, uh, it it really is emblematic of the Renaissance, all right? Um, so again, the idea of the entire Renaissance is that people start looking backwards, not just to like Christianity, which, what the, which is what they've been doing for a thousand years. Christianity is still a big deal, but they look back to 
like Greco-Roman antiquity. And they start reading the stories of Greco-Roman antiquity. And they start like artistically depicting um, the myths of Greco-Roman antiquity and reading the philosophy of Greco-Roman antiquity and combining that uh, with the kind of with Christianity, which is already a big deal. And so if in the middle of the 1500s, you were walking around Florence and you go to the Piazza della Signoria, uh, you'll see um, this statue uh, of Perseus and Medusa. But then there's also like a, you know, a biblical statue of Judith and Holofernes uh, made by Donatello. You'll see a statue of Hercules and the giant Cacus. Um, and it's really a, uh, a, in a depiction of the, the rape of the Sabines as well. And so really a mix of both uh, kind of biblical stories as well as these um, ancient uh, Greek and Roman mythological stories in kind of the center of Florence. And if you go there today, you can see replicas of all these all these statues. Okay, so the story of Perseus is not yet over though, right? He's got the head of Medusa, but now he's got to get home and the journey home is like just as problematic. So first off, uh, he ends up um, basically journeying through Libya, right? Um, in Libya, it, you know, it's a modern day country. In antiquity, it's seen as like kind of a bigger region in North Africa there. And as he's going, the blood's dripping from the head and there are all these poisonous snakes that are pouring out of it. Uh, and then he gets challenged along the way by the Titan Atlas. Remember the guy who's like holding up the world and who tried to trick um, Heracles into holding up the world, uh, but it didn't really work out. But anyway, Perseus is just like, boom, head of Medusa straight to the face. So he turns the giant or he turns the Titan uh, Atlas into stone and that becomes uh, the Atlas Mountain Ranges, or the Atlas Mountains that you see here in modern day Morocco. And we still call them the Atlas Mountains. So you can go to Morocco, hike through the upper and the, um, yeah, the Atlas Mountains there. And he's still not done, right? So he does all that. Uh, he's in Ethiopia for a time. And there he learns that the Princess Andromeda is tied to a rock to be devoured by a sea monster. So we can see a more modern depiction of that over here. And this has happened because Andromeda's mom, Cassiopeia, um, you'll note that they're both like kind of celestial uh, formations um, these days, constellations. Um, but Cassiopeia was bragging that she was more beautiful uh, than these sea nymphs. And so the sea nymphs were got really angry and they're like, we're taking your daughter and she's going to be devoured. And Perseus shows up and Perseus's dad says, yeah, if you can like, if you can free Andromeda, you can marry my daughter. But he actually is just plotting with her daughter's actual fiance to kill Perseus after he does all the hard work. But Perseus is able to free Andromeda. And when he gets back, He's got this like ultimate weapon now. So he's just like lighting fools up with the head of the head of Medusa. So he turns uh, Andromeda's dad to stone and he is able to marry the beautiful princess Andromeda. Now he's not done yet, right? He's not done settling his scores yet. And so uh, what we see next is he ends up heading off uh, to Seraphos where this kind of sort of started, um, but where King Polydectus set him off on the quest. And he gets there, boom, you just got Gorgoned again to the king. And then he installs uh, Dictis, remember the guy who actually brought him out of the water, the brother of the king, as the new king of Seraphos. And he's not done yet, right? He's actually going all the way back to Argos where this all began. Um, and uh, what ends up happening is that the king, Acrisius, right, his grandfather, um, hears that Perseus is still alive which has got to be bad news for Acrisius, because remember, he's got that prophecy that, uh, well, he's got the prophecy that his grandson is going to kill him and take over the throne. So eventually there's a set of athletic games that are set up and Perseus at this time now is so, so heroic um, that he ends up uh, joining the discus competition and throwing this discus so far that he launches it, right? Like out of the stadion, right? Out of the plane area there. Um, and it whacks <laughs> poor King Acrisius upside the head, killing King Acrisius. Um, and, uh, and finally, 
uh, the prophecy that set off this whole chain of events with Perseus ends up coming true. Uh, after that, Perseus um, ends up being worshipped in a number of different places. He's worshipped in Athens. He's worshipped in Argos, right, where this all started. He's worshipped in Seraphos, uh, where that trunk with, um, with his mother, Danae, and little baby Perseus washed up on shore. Now, there's a couple of interesting things here. Um, so that's the, the kind of main arc of the, uh, the myth and the story there. Uh, but it's interesting when we look at other versions of Medusa as well, right? We've talked a lot about um, we've talked a lot about how kind of there are different versions um, of a lot of these different myths, and, and Medusa is no different. So so far, right, we've seen her as this kind of crazy monster, right? When you see her in vase painting, she's facing forward. Uh, she's got these kind of bulging eyes, or her tongue sticking out, the snakes for hair. But in other versions of the myth. Medusa is seen not as some kind of monster like that, but rather as like a beautiful young woman. And what ends up happening in that story is that uh, it's Poseidon who ends up trying to force himself upon Medusa. Uh, but this occurs in the temple of Athena. And so it's like a sacred space that's been corrupted. And as a result, it's Medusa who ends up... Um, as a result, it's Medusa who ends up being kind of cursed uh, and turned with their hair into snakes. And so kind of it's it's interesting to, to look at the character of Medusa as well, right? We usually see the hero as Perseus, but it's interesting to look at it from the op opposite perspective too. And then finally, uh, with this story, um, we see that like even in this kind of gruesome death, there is beauty uh, to be born into the world. So when Medusa's head's cut off, she ends up giving birth to uh, to kind of deity, to uh, heroic type deities. Um, so we have Chris Aeor, uh, who's one of the, the heroes, and then we have the winged horse Pegasus, right? Um, and again, this is kind of told in the story as, as being the offspring then of that uh, event with Poseidon. Um, so Chrysior, the hero, uh, comes out of there, as well as the winged horse Pegasus. Um, and when this is happening, it's said that Medusa was, like, lets out such, like, a yell as she's being decapitated. But it's this kind of beautiful, almost song of a siren, right? This sound that comes out. Um, and it's so beautiful, in fact, that Athena bottles that sound and invents the flute uh, to kind of mimic that sound. And so we get uh, the death of this monster Medusa, but we also, also get birth with Chris Aeor and Pegasus, as well as beauty with the, the sound that comes out of that, that eventually turns in to the flute. So let's go ahead and we're gonna wrap up with that today. Uh, so go ahead and get onto D2L, put in tan for today's uh, quiz. Heracles is looking nice and tan, um, yeah. Put in tan. Uh, we will save the story of uh, Bellerophon and Chimera. We'll lead with that on Wednesday. All right. So go ahead and put this in. I'll hang out for a uh, um, a couple uh, minutes here and try to answer any questions that people have. But once you get your um, your attendance done, feel free to to bounce out of here, and I will see you back on Wednesday. All right. So lots of comments here. He's looking eggshell. No, he's well. Yeah. Look. The, the colors on the PowerPoint like aren't the best colors. It's just something we're gonna have to deal with. Um, let's see, ch -ch -ch -ch. anything else? Helios, Helios needs to up his game because he's not not nearly tan enough. I'll talk to Helios about that. We'll see. We'll see what we can do. Um, let's see here. Earlier I said that we went over Helen of Troy. I thought I had that lecture up. Let me see if um, I, let me check on D2L. I thought that was one that I'd posted, but if not, like, don't worry about it. Let's see here.
Okay, yeah, you guys are totally right. Like, so I just checked on D2L. I didn't put up the um, the the Helen lecture. So, you know, if there's any references to her in the the kind of making of a heroine lecture or anything like that, that stuff's fair game. But I'm not going to be testing you on stuff that that you guys haven't that hasn't been covered um, in the lecture so far. Um, Another question on attendance. Yeah, everyone got attendance credit last week, so I just went in and gave everybody a one out of one for uh, all three days uh, for last week. Um, did I dress up for Halloween? I did not dress up for Halloween, but I did carve a pumpkin. Um, and I don't know, yeah, I think you guys are all too young. Like, So back when I was younger than you, back when I was like 13 years old or 10 years old or something like that, there's this great show on television called dinosaurs and there's this like little baby dinosaur that's just called baby and he keeps hitting the dad over the head with a frying pan and saying not the mama and so i tried to carve the pumpkin in the form of this this little baby dinosaur you, <laughs> you guys can go watch an episode of it sometime um yeah it it turned out so it turned out all right and actually it's looking bad i'm not very artistic but it's looking better now that the pumpkin's kind of like you know, like melting a little bit and getting all crinkly. So it's, it's getting there. I'll, I'll see, um, I'll, I'll see if I can bring a picture of it, uh, for, um, <laughs> for Wednesday. Let's see anything else. Um, yeah, yeah. I hope, I hope everybody dressed up and then, uh, was nice and social distanced for Halloween. Um, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> Somebody says that show traumatized me as a child. What? <laughs> they weren't scary dinosaurs. They were like, it was like a working class show where like the dad was like a construction worker and like his boss was always giving him a hard time or something. <laughs> anyway, guys. All right. Let's go ahead. We are going to wrap up for today. Uh, great work. Um, keep up the awesome work. And I will see everybody back here on Wednesday uh, for Bellerophon and Pegasus, and for Jason and the Argonauts. Have a great couple days, everyone.